All right, um, we're at the top of the hour. Welcome, everyone. See, the voice is okay. Um, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, I am going to talk about open source compatible standards and going towards this. So, uh, for context, right? We have policymakers across the world, but particularly in Europe right now, that are rushing to essentially standardize open source uh, security best practices. That's a bit of a shortcut, but that's kind of essentially what's going on. Um, the organizations who are responsible for standardization in Europe generate their revenues, their revenue by selling standards. Like that's their revenue model. They're literally publishers. Uh, if standards need to be sold, then they're obviously not going to be freely available. <laughs> As open source people, we know this tension really well, right? It, it's tension is everywhere. Um, and of course, that's not compatible with how open source is developed and maintained. Um, arguably, as we'll see, that's not a new problem, um, but it's become much more pressing right now to actually uh, try to solve it. So that's me. Uh, my name is Toby Langel. Um, I uh, used to be a jazz drummer. I got into tech through music. Uh, quite by accident, a band I was touring with needed a website and my brother was into building websites. And so I found that really interesting and exciting and I thought it would be a great side gig. Uh, no longer as a side gig. Um, and I do, I, I now mostly do, so I, I did open source uh, development um, and essentially front end for a long time. And I now do consulting around open source strategy with uh, my own firm, which is a boutique consulting firm because it's just me. Um, and I've essentially bridged sort of open source and standards all of my career, and I'm now heavily involved with the standardization aspects of the European Cyber Resilience Act, also known as the CRA. Um, so today we're going to go through these list of uh, six things. First, I'm going to give you some what I believe are necessary uh, historical background to get the context and understand why the um, sort of landscape is the way it is. Um, we're going to explain the business models of standard organizations because it's necessary to understand that to better understand what the problem is. Um, we're going to talk about the interplay between standards and legislation. Uh, we're going to briefly touch on OpenStand, which is a related successful um, earlier attempt at um, essentially driving openness and standardization uh, bodies and organizations. Um, we're going to start looking at specifically at what an open source compatible standard is, and then we're going to see what we can do, and where, where can we go from, from there. Um, so some background history. Um, there is proto-standardization effort from like um, ancient times, right? Um, fairly quickly, as soon as you get commerce um, trade, um, you need to be able to uh, measure things, um, basic things like uh, the length of the um, destination, um, the, um, you know, the, the surface of land or of cloth, uh, the weight and the volume of, of goods, etc., right? And obviously, uh, the, pa the passing of time. Um, so, you know, uh, I don't know why there's a... That's interesting. There's a locomotive in there. Um, uh, so Something must have happened with a copy paste at some point. Um, so, you know, they've been around for a long time. And what's really interesting is, you know, the sort of like proto standards. Uh, some of them uh, have, um, uh, like, they, they've been around for a very long time and they've been very stable. Uh, so, for example, like the carrot that we use today to um, 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 weight or measure uh, jewels actually comes from the carub seed. Um, and it was used as a weight, um, a measure of weight um, in, uh, I believe, Babylonian, Babylonian times. Um, and then sort of like the last kind of like of those uh, fairly, um, um, uh, you know, important proto standards is the introduction during the French Revolution of the metric system. Um, and so that, that sort of like here's where the locomotive came from. 
uh, yes, and that sort of predates sort of like um, modern standardization, right? Um, and modern standardization really starts with the Industrial Revolution, um, and it, um, it goes beyond basic um, measurement systems and starts to describe essentially norms, right? Um, but it remains very much in-house. Um, and, you know, I, I just want to point out the humble beginnings that are not that far distant in time, right? You're talking about, um, you know, early 800s. Um, so Henry Motsley is the first to standardize the thread sizes of screws. And this sounds like something that's kind of obvious uh, to us today, right? But even within the same organizations, those were done manually by skilled workers, right? And so no two screw actually had the same kind of like uh, thread sizes, um, which is why they didn't have um, bolts mostly, uh, right? And they would sort of like use different devices to, to do the what we do with nuts and bolts today. Um, and so uh, essentially like, the, um, uh, you know, uh, um, Motsley standardizing the through thread sizes allows for um, the creation of matching nuts and bolts and essentially sort of like starts popularizing nuts and bolts, right? Later on, Motsley went into pioneering what um, is, you know, now called interchangeability, which is the ability to purchase nuts and bolts, the same, you know, the compatible ones, right? So sort of like a distant cousin of interoperability um, uh, from different uh, providers. Like this was literally impossible before. Um, and, and you will have to wait until 1841, still, you know, uh, screw thread measurements um, for um, this notion to spread beyond a single organization, beyond, you know, in-house in, in sort of standards, and to become sort of like national, uh, unof unofficial national standards, um, and sometimes even beyond uh, borders. Of course, with the um, second part of the Industrial Revolution, like this accelerates tremendously, right? Um, as uh, you have an increase in trade because of the redu reduction of, of uh, transport um, due to rail lines and also uh, the telegraph, you start to have mass production of goods, right? And you start to have like an, an, um, a complexity of the kind of products that are built that requires supply chains, right? Um, the moment you start to build like a locomotive, then you start to, you probably want to get your bolts from somewhere. You probably want to get like your cogs from somewhere, et cetera, right? And the soon, as soon as you're starting to do this, you essentially need like standards because if you don't, everything is incredibly complex, messy, um, and painful. And so um, uh, uh, this accelerates with the buildup towards World War I. Uh, where you start to have uh, countries that need to uh, build weapons, uh, uh, machinery, transport, et cetera, um, and who are heavily investing in, in, that, in industrialization and who are also pushing for standards uh, uh, because, well, uh, you know, they need everything to work together. Um, and uh, notably, um, ammunition standards are uh, driven by uh, countries during the uh, First World War. Um, so you have mass adoption of standards at this point, um, and you have you start to have the emergence of national and international standards organizations. Um, so you know at the national level, you have organizations like um, uh, the Engineering Standards Committee that's established in London in 1901, which still exists, right? It's like a BSI group is literally the same organization. Um, and you know, a fairly quickly after World War One, you have similar organizations that uh, exist in the different countries. Um, you have some, um, you know, interesting international ones that um, spread up. At, wow. Oh. Um, at this point, um, you know, the International Telegraph Union (ITU), which is now, of course, the International Telecommunications Union, it's the same acronym, but you know, sort of broaden its, massively broaden its scope in the process, um, and IEC, right? Um, and what's really important and you know, valuable to think about for uh, sort of like this conversation here is that at the national level, these organizations, they're trade associations, right? It's like all of the people doing manufacturing of like iron or, you know, cogs or whatnot that get together and like decide together what standards they want, right? Um, and most of the international organizations around those 
um, they're actually membership organizations of those trade associations, right? So you have the, you know, uh, the, the German um, uh, Bolts and, and Cog uh, Trade Association that uh, uh, bands together with the French one and the German one, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so after World War II, a few of those, like ITU, become affiliated with the UN, but that's not the case for most of them. Um, and you also see sort of like a rise, uh, with the rise of software, um, um, in um, uh, sort of like um, international industry consortia um, that uh, start arriving on, you know, on, on the scene um, in the early 80s, uh, W3C, and there are a whole bunch of others. So that leads me to the business model of those um, organizations. And we're going to briefly look at two, the national trade um, associations and the international membership organizations. Um, and so, as I said before, the, the national trade um, um, associations, they're um, essentially nonprofit publishers, right? So sort of like their business model is they collect membership fees, um, they leverage their members' expertise to create standards, and then they sell those standards to practitioners for a fee, right? That's a, just like literally how they work. I mean, there, is, uh, there are other things like certification and a bunch of things that are, have sort of been added onto it. But essentially, that's what they are. Right? It's even more interesting for those um, sort of international um, membership associations of those national trade associations, because basically what they do is they collect membership fees from the national organizations. They leverage the expertise of the members of those national uh, organizations and sometimes from other invited experts. And then they create standards that they license exclusively to each country, uh, each country's trade associations to sell to practitioners in that country itself, right? So you will have like a European um, um, uh, membership association, which is gonna create a standard, sell it, uh, license it to the German national organization, which itself is going to sell it to its practitioners, right? So those are the business models. Um, and yeah, I want to point out, um, uh, you know, quite clearly that we shouldn't be judgmental of those business models, right? Like this, this it just happened naturally and this entirely made sense and it worked for a very long time. So I'm not saying, oh, uh -huh, they're trying to make money on top of standards or anything of that nature. That's just the way it is, right? It's an important and valuable to understand that, but this is just like a fact of the world, right? They make sense historically. And I feel like they become more of an issue um, as uh, you start having an interplay between standards and legislation, right? So while standards are just an industry thing, that's kind of fine. Um, but suddenly when they come like, uh, they become all looped into a legislation, then that uh, that's, starts to be, create more tensions, we'll say. Um, sorry, so, so let's look into this, right? Um, so when it comes to interplay with legislation, it's been going on for a while, right? As I was saying before, um, during the Industrial Revolution, um, in particular the second one, there's a huge push from countries for standardization, right? When you, as a country, when you're at war and you want to be able to get your nuts and bolts from whoever is able to make them right now, like it's kind of nice if they're all like are the same, right? So, you know, there's been like a whole push for this, um, uh, also around safety concerns, right? Um, uh, there were uh, a number of uh, memorable accidents in, in, the, in, in the industrial age and uh, having standardization on how to properly do things, what um, quality iron was, et cetera, was uh, important and useful. And then there's a second sort of interplay, which is important, is um, liability. Right? Uh, when something goes wrong um, with um, a large um, and you know a, a large object, a house, a building or something, um, you have liability uh, uh, issues and you usually end up in court. And at some point, the judge is going to ask, well, was that um, building built to code? right? Was it built using the standards that are accepted? as best practices in your industry, 
And you kind of want to be able to say yes of when that happens. Um, because if not, like, you're probably going to be, um, you know, show, like, it's going to be easier for the judge to say that you're liable for whatever happened. So there's kind of like an implicit um, uh, interplay here that happens uh, where um, essentially to protect yourself from liability and also at some point to be able to get insurance as a business, um, you need to abide by whatever standards um, your national organization believes are the right one to build whatever it is that you're building. More recently, um, there has been a real desire to formalize the relationship um, of standards with legislation. Um, um, in particular, uh, not only for liability, but also for conformance, right? Um, for a number of reasons. Um, one is it's really hard for legislators to just keep on top of all of the different uh, complexities of our modern industries, right? Um, you know, as someone who's been elected to um, uh, create law can't be also an expert in cybersecurity and uh, nuclear power plants and, uh, you know, nuts and bolts, right? Um, and so, uh, kind of essentially delegating the expertise to um, domain people, domain expert, um, makes a lot of sense. And secondly, it makes it also easier to keep up to the pace of innovation, right? Law is longer to change than standards, which is longer to change than uh, software. Um, so it, this kind of slip uh, makes sense. Um, and this has been formalized in Europe um, essentially by um, this concept that um, if you adopt and implement uh, harmonized standards, um, so that it, standards that are recognized by the European Commission um, through existing legislation, um, then it creates a presumption of conformity, right? So you can essentially uh, get the CE mark for your products. And this is what the CRA is about for software. Um, so we now really have a strong tie between standards on one end and legislation on the other. Um, and, you know, that, that's, that creates a number of uh, outcomes, right? Um, um, you know, the first one is if standards become part of legislation, but aren't freely accessible, then legislation itself doesn't, you know, isn't freely accessible, right? Um, and this was successfully argued in court fairly recently by the nonprofit uh, publicresource.org, um, uh, who uh, argued that um, um, uh, US, EU citizens should be able to access the harmonized standards that describe the safety of toys. That seems fairly reasonable, right? Um, but the downside is that the um, solution that is discussed uh, to uh, essentially make those standards accessible as the court order requires uh, aren't exactly going to solve the problem, right? Uh, the devil's in the details often, um, and um, um, there are ways to uh, make it possible for you to access a document uh, that don't necessarily make the document accessible in the free and open way that um, open source practitioners would, you know, that would come to mind to open source practitioners, right? For example, you can entirely uh, make it available, but you have to go in a physical room somewhere to look at it. Um, all right, so I'm going to make a, you know, fairly radical shift to talk about open stand. Um, so, you know, to some degree, the tension that we were, um, that we're seeing here um, between um, structures and, and practices that come from the industrial age um, uh, was sort of more modern um, practices, both in terms of the information age, so it's the software industry, um, but um, also in terms of the um, how the standards uh, are used in legislations in different ways today than they were um, at, during their industrial age. Um, this tension is not new, right? Um, and um, it's it's been successfully addressed to some degree. 
by OpenStand. So OpenStand, for um, those of you who are not familiar with it, is um, a cross-organization project that was launched in 2012 um, and came from IEEE Internet Architecture Board, ITF, ISOC, and W3C, um, and essentially describes standards which are um, built in an open way. They called it a new paradigm for global open standards back then. Right? So when people talk about standards, um, open standards, in, in our world, in the open source world, right, this is what we have in mind. Right? And when you think about you know, a W3C standard, it's incredibly different than how it's built and what it, what it describes than you would, um, you know, than um, a description of how you have to build, uh, for example, a building or um, the threads of uh, bolts, and, uh, bolts and, and nuts. Um, so now I think it's time to look at what exactly would need to be in an, in an um, open source compatible standard. Um, so essentially, what's interesting is there isn't a lot more um, needed for an open source standard to be compatible, sorry, for a standard to be compatible with open source um, that you don't already find in the open stand definition. Um, the very sort of like basic things that I was able to come up with um, was the license of the standard has to be an open source or open source adjacent license, right? Um, essentially so that you can fork it. Um, we've seen in uh, organizations like W3C uh, and what we in the past that being able to pursue work that's abandoned and that goes in a direction that isn't a good fit for the industry or for a community uh, is a good thing, right? So forkable standards are really useful. Uh, secondly, we want standards that are available for free in an open format. Um, and we mean this in a, you know, a really open sourcey way, right? You want to be able to download it from somewhere, right? And then it has to be like in, a, in, in an open format. Uh, you don't want to have to go physically in a document and like be able to take notes and then go back and, and, and share that with your community. And that's, that's not going to work, right? I, obviously, you want the standard to be royalty free. Uh, uh, for the kind of standards that we're talking about right now with the CRA, those are mainly process standards and there usually aren't patents around those. But uh, patents are a big issue uh, in a number of uh, areas of software. Um, and so open source compatible standards need to be um, royalty free from a patent perspective. And then lastly, you want open participation, right? Uh, because of the structure, um, uh, you know, traditional structure of uh, these trade associations, uh, it, it, they were essentially closed associations meant for people of the trade, right? Um, with standards today impacting everyone in, um, in the way they are and with software being developed the way it is, uh, those models aren't like, I, I don't know, those models aren't um, the right uh, fit um, um, for open source related um, software. Um, to my surprise, and what's really interesting is there's actually um, a document that describes this pretty precisely um, and predates even OpenStand, right? It's um, the open standards requirement for software uh, from the open source initiative from the OSI. Um, I, I must admit that I had seen this a very long time ago and then entirely forgot about it. And I wrote a whole document explaining exactly what should be in an open source standard. And it just pretty much is what's in that document, right? Um, but, you know, conversely, um, this is kind of my job. I'm fairly well plugged into what's going on. And like, no one had mentioned this in like a decade, right? So it does point out that we might have a marketing problem around this and that not many people are actually aware that such a document exists and that it actually describes kind of what we need. All right, so finally, where do we go from there? So essentially, if you look at the problem, right, um, that's kind of how I see the problem, like, you know, given the context I described before is 
there are current standardization processes that are accepted by legislation, and we don't have a really good alternative to offer. We're just like grumbling around saying that that's not going to work for us, right? That's not great and not really conducive to change. When we're asked, we don't really have a good answer. We're kind of hand wavy about it. That's nah, not going to work, right? So I think that's a problem, and it's a problem that we can fix. And then lastly, we actually have some good solutions, but we're terrible at marketing them. So I think we have a huge opportunity here. Um, first of all, with OSI's OSR, we actually have a pretty good definition of what we need. Secondly, with OpenStand, we have a playbook of how to market it, right? OpenStand, like it's not something that's super known to us, but it's something that kind of really defined a category of what an open standard is. It's referenced all over the place when you have conversations around, around the, the, the topic. Thirdly, um, the CRA-related standardization that's going, that's essentially starting right now, um, is a unique opportunity to experience and document um, the challenges of managing the existing processes, right? And then lastly, um, in Europe, the um, regulation that essentially um, formalizes the connection between standard bodies and legislation is going to have a revision this year and next, I think. So this is also a really important opportunity to um, you know, talk about these issues and see if it is possible to influence this legislation in order to make it easier or to account for the needs of open source and standardization of open source related activities, right? So where do we go from here? Well, you know, I believe that we need a concerted industry-wide effort to spread this new concept of open source compatible standardization across a, uh, I mean, through a new cross organizational initiative, right? So, so something like OpenStand, but a new version of it. So that's really what, um, towards what I think we should be going. Um, and so essentially that's all I have for you today. And I'm super curious to hear your thoughts on if this makes sense to you, if this is a direction that um, you'd see, you know, possible, et cetera. So really opening the floor for discussions and, and questions. Thank you. So I saw, oh, lots of hands. So, so you did not miss a definition of those on slide one, because I, I think if I had attempted to define this, uh, I would have like, it would be slide one to like 99, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I understand. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, I think the new ones are more, um, but yes, um, I, 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 yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, I personally think that that's, so from my experience of um, bridging the sort of like the open source and standard spaces, um, everyone has a kind of different definition of what a standard is. Um, and um, it feels a little like the tabs versus space conversation, in my opinion. 
So that, that's why I purposefully like don't talk about it. Um, I, I kind of see all of these different things as uh, vaguely uh, similar um, because you're going to have you know some some organizations are going to call a standard something and uh, are going to like what is a standard for an organization might not be considered a harmonized standard for the EU, might not be considered a standard for the US, et cetera. So to me, it's kind of what really matters is the impact that they have, um, 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 you know, how, how much they're used, whether like you have to implement them or not. Um, and I kind of use the term very loosely. So yeah, no slide that you missed in there. Please. So, so that's a great question. Um, so just to be clear, while OSI's OSR didn't have the um, sort of public, um, you know, success that OpenStan did, OpenStan was successful, right? Um, I, I think you want to distinguish like the standard, like the technical content of a standard, right? Was how much it spreads. Um, I, um, I think that um, the timing for OSR probably wasn't good. I'm suspecting, but I don't know, that OpenStand probably was a, because um, OpenStand is later, comes later than uh, OSR, right? So I'm suspecting that OpenStand gave in uh, some of the things that were in, op in OSR in order to get consensus and 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 get something out there and have something um, uh, be successful and be you know widely adopted, um, so you know to to answer your question, I think that there's like two different aspects. One is how good the standard is, and the second one is like how you know how deployed how how deployed how successful it is. Um, and I think that OSR is good as a standard. It wasn't successful as as at being deployed. And I think it was mostly a timing issue, not a quality of the standard issue. And I think the timing now is good to the, to essentially um, you know broadcast something like OSR. Is it OSR itself? Is it sort of like a you know a more modern version? Um, you know to be defined, right? But um, yeah. So th essentially, I make the distinction between these two. Yeah. And there was a second question. Yeah. NIST? If, uh, um, uh, whether there is such uh, incentive uh, towards the US-based legislation? This is just a question that you described. Uh, so uh, my take is uh, yes, right? Like there's a similar movement. Um, I don't remember the exact language, but I think in the, in the Biden Act on, on uh, supply, the software supply chain, um, there is uh, the, the the term that's used is like safe harbor uh, if you implement good practices as described in like the NIST standards. Uh, so I think there's like the same kind of direction and the same um, um, the same intent, right? To essentially turn standards um, into uh, to tie legislation to standards um, and to um, essentially um, make it a requirement if you want to be protected, if you want to be conformant um, and, uh, or be protected from, from li um, for liability issues, to not make it a requirement, but make it a lot easier for you to do that by implementing those standards. Please. Sorry. 
Um, so I'm, I'm hearing two questions in there. One is, how do we market this? Um, and I think uh, we should um, talk to the open stand folks and just leverage that playbook, right? So I think that's the first step. Um, and when it comes to benefits, um, look, we're looking at having standards um, help with compliance of legislation that everyone's going to be subject to, including open source to some degree, right? Um, it essentially helps everything if like, an open source practitioner can read those standards, right? Because the reality right now is everyone would have to go and, and fork like a couple of, you know, a hundred bucks here and there uh, to be able to read it, which is just not going to happen, right? So we're going to have these really awkward conversations where people are going to, you know, sort of tiptoe around the issue, sort of like uh, share those standards in like, uh, you know, semi-closed rooms, et cetera. Uh, you know, it's not great. It's also probably not, you know, very legal in most cases. Um, and so, um, so I think that's the benefits, right? The benefit is it is it um, is it just it makes it compatible with what is a huge part of the supply chain. Yeah. Language yeah. And get somebody to say yeah. Yeah. I mean, just for the purpose of having a discussion, it, it was was entirely pointless. Uh, yeah, I'm 100 percent with you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, please. Yeah, yeah, no, it is very brief, yeah. Um, but what astonished me is that there's no reference to the OSI definition, even though it's by OSI, that at least the standard should be not putting any further restrictions than the OSI definition. Yeah, so that's in my definition, so I didn't do all of that work for nothing, <laughs> you know. But yes, I agree. Yeah, it should. But it's also from 2006. I mean, you know, like we've made a lot of... Uh, um, um, progress and uh, understanding not only of the, the value of forking code, but also the value of forking documentation and, uh, you know, specifications and standards. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not, just to be clear, I'm not saying verbatim, let's go, let's take that and go, right? I'm saying, eh, it's kind of like really close. It's, it's funny that I missed it, you know? <laughs> it's, it's interesting. I am not taking that bait. Uh -uh. No, but I might point out that you mentioned Creative Commons, and we also have one semester when we have no derivatives of our courses, so we may want to clarify which or such of them. For sure, absolutely. Felix, I think you had your hand up. In your view, who should pay for the development of the open source comparative standards, and is the, does the answer differ based on whether it's a uh, harmonized standard that provides the presumption of conformity? That is a uh, that is a, a good question. I shouldn't have given you uh, the right to ask that question. <laughs> I haven't thought about this one bit. Uh, I think it's a good. This is a great question, for sure. Yeah, I mean, hey, folks, this is a half baked idea, okay? I mean, <laughs> you know, you know. but yes, no, those are, those are good questions for sure. Yes. The original standards and how trade associations, they had an industry such that they could see the benefit. Of Absolutely, for sure. Yeah. They can't see it. They can't see the benefit of what's open source people. Right. No, I mean, that, that's an absolutely good point. So, I mean, I can try to, I don't know what time do we have in, in 
No. <laughs> um, so, Felix, <clears throat> um, I think there is, my understanding is that the commission actually um, pays some form of money to standard organizations to develop harmonized standards. Um, so it wouldn't sound unreasonable to me, but I am not a policy person and I understand nothing about how that world works, right? Um, that for, you know, in some areas, um, this could come with strings attached, such as uh, if you want that money, then the standard uh, has to be available freely or something like this. So, so that seems like something that could be um, looked into. Um, and then sort of like as a, you know, another aspect of this is um, there is, you know, it, like the, the um, sort of la last wave of standard organizations, the consortias, right? They have found models that aren't fantastic, but that work, right? They get membership fees and, um, uh, you know, they create patent pools um, and um, they provide the standards for free, right? So, you know, those are doable too. No. no some, of them some of yeah, no, sure, but most of them you don't. Yeah, so so I mean, uh, uh, I, I'm not familiar with every standard body, obviously, right? But those that I'm familiar with, ECMA, um, is, that's not true for most of their standards now. Uh, W3C, that's not true. What we G, which is uh, you know, admittedly like a very special org, that's not true. Also. Um, ITF, that's not true. So most of those consortia or, or open models, like the, the um, and a lot of them now are using GitHub, you know, and, and, and it's sort of like normal, normal open source processes to, to create their standards. So like I, um, you know, th th like it exists, right? It exists, it works. Um, and, and of course, like, you know, it's slightly different, et cetera, like the, for sure. But I think there, I'm not going to comment on this. So, so, so that makes sense if essentially you're saying that, that if somebody's going to develop a product that's based on this language and they're going to make money out of that product, then it's reasonable for them to, to pay a fee. But it's not reasonable for a, an open source developer who wants to make something that might be. Oh, I, uh, so I, I hundred percent. No, so absolutely, and that's part of the OSR's definition, right? Um, uh, and open stand doesn't have a provision on a royalty free, right? Uh, it, it allows RAND, um, which you know I personally think is a problem, but was probably there in order to uh, actually be able to push something and, 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 and build consensus, right? Uh, of course, I 100% agree that this shouldn't be something that you would find um, in a you know more modern open source compatible um, uh, solution, um, and. Yeah, you know, none of the organizations that I mentioned before, ITF, uh, W3C, et cetera, have uh, requirements uh, around signing contracts or uh, licensing fees, right? Um, what they usually do is the IP looks something like you're free to use this, uh, royalty free, as long as you don't sue. Uh, uh, so the, it essentially allows um, defensive usage of patent and makes you lose your the benefit of the license if you're being offensive with your patent portfolio, um, which is you know again a trade-off, 
for sure. Fair point. That requires on us actually making those standards and applying them and, uh, and showing that they're showing their value. Fair point. Absolutely. I'll take a last question. I have a trick question. Oh, sh so I'm, I'm not going to take a last question. Um, no, absolutely. It's a good point. There is um, there has been some convergence uh, over uh, the what last decade between open source and standardization. Right, we've seen standardization adopt open source practices um, in terms of um, how they write specs and and, and how they publish specs, and um, we've also seen um, you know open source the open source industry start paying more attention. Um, to this and start uh, uh, creating their own structures uh, to uh, publish uh, specifications. Um, and so um, I can talk to you a little bit about of what the Eclipse Foundation does in that space because I'm helping them out with uh, the compliance work that they're doing. And Jory here can uh, speak uh, a lot about um, the um, effort that she leads at the Linux Foundation on this topic. So this is not a trick question. This is a segue. Please be my guest. Oh, no. Oh, no. No. I'm just talking. No. I'm, I'm, okay. I right. think it's useful. So I was just going to share um, that I think it's, at the Linux Foundation, and Jeff's obviously involved in this, but about 20% of our, our projects are um, in some way, shape, or form um, related to specification development. Maybe they are working on spec, or maybe they're using, like, for example, the open chain. There you guys are. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, have actually published two um, publicly available specifications um, with ISO. And so I, I think we are growing our body of evidence, if you will, for how to um, do open source and open standards and spec um, specifications successfully. We just need to kind of keep proving the points out and having the interesting and tricky conversations on educating people about the availability um, of uh, open source compatible patent licensing um, and then you know uh, marketing that frankly uh, as sort of examples for, for how to how to do it and that would be my pitch for people yeah hundred percent I approve of this message all right thank you very much folks <laughs>